All right, let's go over a little vocabulary that you're going to need to uh, to kind of navigate the class this semester. So, the first terms I want to introduce you to is um, positive analysis and normative analysis. Now, mostly this year, I'm going to be sticking to positive analysis. Now, this is um, analysis of what we think the outcomes will be um, if you do if we take a certain action. Um, this is going to be fact-based, um, and here's the thing. We should be able to, as we do research, we should be able to say, well, it looks like this is true, or it looks like this is not true. Um, that's not to say that there's never going to be disagreements um, when you're doing positive analysis. Um, again, economics is really hard as a science um, to nail down firm conclusions, and so you'll still see some disagreements um, between you know, kind of fact-based stuff, but um, this should really be our starting place before we do anything else, so that we we know what's gonna what's going to happen, rather than worrying about normative analysis, which is basically deciding which outcomes do we think are better, and this is the part where you and I can have the exact same facts and come to different conclusions on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. It just depends on our personal values, our opinions. Um, there's no like, hey, you're wrong about this. The only you're wrong happens with positive analysis. So if you're making value um, value judgments based on bad facts, that's bad. Um, but um, if you have good facts, if we've done the positive analysis, we've done it well, then we can kind of decide, okay, so here's the outcome. Is this a good outcome? Is this a bad outcome? Um, generally, we divide economics up into two big um, courses whenever we study it, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Now, microeconomics is the study of the behavior of individuals and um, individual firms, or sometimes um, an individual market, but macroeconomics is kind of broad-based, study of the economy as a whole. Um, a lot of times it's study of the economy at a, a nationwide level. Now we cover a little bit of both in this course, but primarily this is a macroeconomics course where we're going to be studying like big picture stuff rather than like um, smaller scale stuff. Um, throughout this course, you'll hear me talk about goods and services. Um, these are the two things that we can produce. We can produce goods and services. Goods is like physical stuff. Um, services are, are basically actions that we take. So if I make a hamburger, okay, that's a good. If I give an economics lecture, um, that's, a, um, that's a service. So goods are a pretty small part of the US economy, at least relative to services, it's about one third of US GDP. Um, we can divide it up into durable goods and non-durable goods. Um, so durable goods is, it's what it sounds like, it's stuff that sticks around. Um, anything that you buy and intend to, you know, keep and use for a long time. And these tend to be big ticket items, cars, furniture, appliances. Um, and one of the important things to know about durable goods is you'll see demand of durable goods kind of slip during a recession because a lot of these are optional things or at least things that you can put off um, because they're, they're kind of expensive. They're things that maybe you'll need eventually, but I, I don't necessarily need it today. And then there's um, non-durable goods, which is like food and laundry detergent and gas. These are things that the demand stays fairly stable because we don't have a lot of options there. Like you, you need food, you need, you know, laundry detergent and gas. Um, so demand is going to stay stable even during a recession. Now services, again, these are things where we're um, not producing something physical, but you can't 
ignore it as far as it being production. It's still something that's creating value for society. Um, and this is actually accounts for two thirds of US GDP. We are a service based economy. Um, so, um, for the rest of this class, um, I'm going to use GNS in your notes to uh, denote goods and services. So don't get confused about that. Um, if you ever hear me say firms, that's the same as a company or a business. Um, they're the folks who produce the goods and services. Um, and then I'll talk about households. These are the people who consume goods and services. So we've kind of got these two forces. We've got firms making the stuff and um, households consuming the stuff. An entrepreneur, these are the people who create firms and, and run these firms. They're the ones making the decisions on what goods and services will be produced. This is a place where I depart from your textbook a little bit. Your textbook says that people decide what is being produced. And that's not really true. Um, the, the entrepreneurs who are running these businesses, they decide what gets produced. Now, if they don't produce what people want, then they'll get pushed out of business. So um, households kind of decide this indirectly, but a lot of times um, entrepreneurs actually produce a product that no one thought that they wanted, but turns out was very useful. Um, entrepreneurs make sure and secure finances um, to get this business off the ground. Very important to understand that entrepreneurs take big risks. Um, that's one of the reasons I don't own my own business is that it's a really risky thing. Um, half of all new businesses close in the first four years. So it's one of those things where we know that entrepreneurs are very important to a well-running economy, but we also know entrepreneurship is risky. Um, so it's, it makes sense to have policies that reward entrepreneurs for taking big risks. Um, that's one of the nice things about capitalism is that it basically says, okay, if you're going to take this big risk, we're going to reward you for it if you're successful. Um, but there's also things like bankruptcy protection that um, protects entrepreneurs um, if a business venture fails. And that's really important to have some sort of safety net there so that entrepreneurs don't um, aren't too gun shy about uh, starting a business. All right, revenue um, is the money that you receive in exchange for a good and service. Profit is what you have left over of that revenue after you pay your costs. So revenue minus cost equals profit. And in this class, remember that cost is opportunity cost, not necessarily just money. All right, technology is a word that we use a little differently in economics. Um, technology doesn't necessarily mean something modern. It's just the process that a firm uses to make a good or service. So like a shovel is technology. Um, you know, um, I don't know, um, uh, using an, an ox to plow your field. That is technology. Now, it's not modern technology. Um, what you might think of as technology is something called innovation. Um, innovation is what we call an advancement in technology. Um, so if I move from an ox plowing my field to a tractor plowing my field, then that is using a new technology, and we call that innovation. Okay. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is a huge thing. It's one of the big things that divides unprosperous countries from prosperous countries. And that's um, physical and organizational structures uh, and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. Okay, what, what in the world? Okay, I'll give you an example. So whenever we built this school, okay, um, it was very easy to provide it with water. It's very easy to provide it with electricity and internet. And there were roads that already led up to it. Um, imagine that um, 
the water systems didn't exist. The electricity systems didn't exist. All these things didn't exist. S sewer didn't exist. So all of a sudden, whenever I make this new building, I have to find a way to get clean water. I have to find a way to get electricity. I have to build roads for us to get here. I have to uh, find a way to get rid of, you know, our poop. We didn't have to do hardly any of that. Um, yes, we had to kind of tap in to those infrastructures, um, but the infrastructure already existed. So our costs were actually super, super low um, compared to what it would have been if all of that started from scratch. And there's also um, organizational infrastructure like court systems, um, educational systems. You know, if I want to hire someone in a high skilled position, if you don't have infrastructure existing already, then you have to do all of that training to get someone who is able to do this job. But since educational infrastructure already exists, we just get to hire somebody. So infrastructure is one of those things that um, if you have a prosperous nation, they're going to have lots of good infrastructure. And when you have a nation that's not prosperous, they're not going to have that. Um, and nations who have a lot of instability have trouble building infrastructure. And um, nations who've been at war, sometimes they've had their infrastructure destroyed. And that's one of those things that leads to poverty for these nations. Um, that's one of the, the roles that government uh, can play a big role in is making sure that the stability exists and the organization exists to create this infrastructure. All right, let's talk about physical capital and human capital. That I would say is the other thing that makes um, nations very prosperous is having physical capital and human capital. Now, we don't use capital in the terms that um, some other markets do, like uh, people talking about like gaining financial capital. We're not talking about money here. We're talking about produced goods here that help produce other goods and services more efficiently. For example, factories, tractors, computers. So I can make one of these pencils, but it's going to take me forever. Um, but if I build a factory that helps me produce these pencils more efficiently, then um, my production is going to be much, much less costly. Um, and it's going to make my workers more efficient. Um, it allows society to produce more with the same amount of labor and natural resources. This is like bingo. Um, this is what we want, is we want more production with the same amount of resources. Um, so that's what physical capital enables. Um, you know, if I'm trying to dig a hole in the ground, okay, you know, I'm like clawing at it with my hands, that doesn't work very well. You hand me a shovel, all of a sudden I'm doing more work. You hand me a tractor, all of a sudden, I'm doing a ton of work, and I'm still the same me, okay? Um, I'm still using the same amount of, of labor, but um, with physical capital, I'm producing a lot more. Now, something I want to mention, and you'll see why I'm pointing this out now, this is something that's transferable from person to person. So, um, if I get fired, okay, and I was using a shovel, Okay, my employer can take that shovel, give it to the next guy. Um, but the other big kind of capital is human capital. Human capital is knowledge, experience, and skills um, that increases the productivity of labor. Now, let me explain that human capital is not just how many people you have. So if I hire more people, I'm increasing my amount of labor. I am not increasing my amount of human capital. Human capital is taking the labor that I already have and making it more efficient. Um, so that's basically done by work experience, education. I didn't mention training, uh, like on the job training. Um, this also uh, increases the productivity of labor. So that's one of the reasons why um, you might hear me promoting education and job training and all of these kind of programs where 
um, you're making laborers more efficient, so increasing their productivity. Something to note, this is not transferable from employee to employee. So if you spent all of this time training this employee and pouring in this human capital to them, and then they get fired, all that human capital went out the door with them. So um, if you have a field um, that has a lot of human capital, requires a lot of training, then turnover, okay, losing people all the time is going to be very expensive. So in these fields, a lot of times it's more expensive to pay your workers well, keep your workers happy, keep them there. Um, so one reason I mentioned this is you want to be working in a field where um, it requires lots of training, lots of skills. Okay, you want to make sure you're getting educated, either you know in a school or college or a job training program. So you're you have skills that aren't easily replaceable, um, because usually those are going to have higher wages and better working conditions. Um, so. Um, one of the things that I encourage, um, you know, not just from a nation perspective, but from a um, from a personal perspective, you want to make yourself a more productive worker. That makes your you more valuable. So I recommend that people acquire physical capital and human capital. Physical capital being anything that makes you more productive at what you do. Okay, tools. Um, um, any, anything that you need to, um, to do what you do better um, within reason. Um, and I encourage y'all to, you know, train yourselves up, learn new skills, um, especially at this stage in your life. Because once you gain those skills, no one can take those away from you. They don't take up space in your house. Um, the only cost is some time on the front end, and you'll have those skills for the rest of your life. One other thing I want to mention about physical capital. Physical capital is one of the reasons why we have such a wide dispersion of wealth. That's why we have kind of a wealth gap. Because one of the things that makes people very productive are really expensive. Like these big factories, um, you know, building a big uh, network of different things. Um, and that's something the average person can't afford. Now, you a, a person can get financing from like a venture capitalist or, or something else, but that's a very risky um, thing to do sometimes, especially if they're getting loans. Um, so because you have to get this capital to, um, uh, to become very productive, to become very wealthy, um, that sometimes leads between this, this gap between these wealthy people and these poorer people. Um, so that's one of those big things that divides the rich and the poor is being able to afford um, lots of physical capital. All right. So that's the terminology that we need to know. Um, keep that somewhere in the back of your mind. I'll try to bring up this terminology as we go. But uh, now you know what I'm talking about.